Good morning, everyone. And we are diligently going through the book of Proverbs. And we are in Proverbs chapter 30. We are studying this words of this wise man, Agur, who is the son of his father, Jacob, who gave him originally the wisdom that he possesses. And now we come today to a passage that you're probably already familiar with because it is the only prayer in the book of Proverbs. Pray like this and you will pray with wisdom. Uh, I would like for you to set a tab at a text that I want to take a moment to get off the highway, take the exit, and look at the view. Uh, I think it'll help us in understanding verse 6, and it's Acts chapter 17. So if you will set a tab at Acts chapter 17, and then we begin uh, our exposition, Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Do not add to his word, otherwise he will convict you and prove you to be a liar. Here's the prayer. Verse 7, you know it already, don't you? Two things I ask of you, do not withhold them from me before I die. Verse 8, a deceitful lie keep far from me. Poverty or riches do not give me. Provide for me my quota of food. Interesting word, quota. Uh, verse 9, lest, or you may have otherwise, it's a summary. I may be full and disown, deny, and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so do violence to the name of God. We have two becomes in our text this morning, uh, in verse 9 and in verse 10. Uh, remember the word become. It's a transition word. It's not one, it's not two, but it's between one and two. We're transitioning. Here is 10. And it starts a new section of wisdom. We are through with his conclusion on the prayer. Do not slander a slave to his master, otherwise, or you may have lest, he become he may curse you and you, and here's our second become, our transition, liable. I think those becomes are important. That's why I picked them out to show you today. Well, here is our exposition, Proverbs 30, beginning this morning in verse 6. This is Agur. We are learning about him. He has told us in the past that he has no knowledge, has no ability to understand. Uh, he is void of the knowledge of God. But he also tells us, verse 1 and line 3, and we have adapted a different translation than you have in the King James or the New American Standard, uh, you do have it in the NIV, which is a newer translation, and you do have it in the English Standard Version. It's a pickup from a line that was translated from the Protestant Reformation by a scholar. So if you have something different, just listen and see how it fits the argument that Agur is making. He says he is weak. He says he knows nothing. But he tells us in line three that he's going to prevail. He's going to prosper. He's going to move on and move forward. We are learning how he is doing that. And the way he is doing that is, of course, 
by knowing the Word of God, and he is setting forth its veracity and its character, and he is going to do it by prevailing prayer. So, beginning in verse 6, the Hebrew Bible, of which Agur is referring to, is not what you have in your hand or on your lap, because they didn't have Hebrew Bibles back then. It was all oral. The priests had them. The king had a translation and a script, but not the common people. So he is giving us the immoral authority that his father Jacob, who gave, we gave recognition to in line one, it is the words of God that were passed down through the family to him. Passed on to the Son. Wisdom from God alone. And he tells us right here, it is not to be tampered with. That men, common men, do not recognize or appreciate the authority of the Scriptures. The veracity, the truth of the Word of God. Line 2, he gives us his reason for that. For by adding to them, since man has no wisdom, it would be a product of worthlessness. Man teaching man. This is no authority. The authority comes from the Lord alone. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Moses commanded the children of Israel not to add or subtract from the commands that he had given because they weren't His words or His thoughts. They were from God and God alone. Verbal plenary inspiration. That's what we believe. It is through the personality. It is through the background. It is through the education of the individual. But the words are from God. And so, that's verbal plenary inspiration. And Moses puts an exclamation point on it by saying it's a life or death proposition if you add to these words. Observe it is presupposed, presumed, that Agur's wisdom is in fact inspired and authoritative. And by it, men, he said, are proven to be liars. Now, I stopped and pondered that. You have to ponder these thoughts. How do you prove men to be liars? Well, you use the Scriptures. That's how you prove it. And that's why I want to divert your attention for a moment to how the Apostle Paul instructed us to deal with outsiders in Acts chapter 17. What would we set forth as the proposition? Well, I tried to do it this way. I would say anyone who opposes the truth, the Word of God, is in fact a liar. No matter whatever position he takes, he is a liar. And our wise man here is saying without qualification, the Scriptures are the authority over him and over the people he speaks to. So, in every discussion, we have to ask, what is the authority? People challenge you. Well, that's your interpretation, they say. You've heard that often. That's your interpretation. Well, we want to ask, well, what is your authority? Is it man? Is it your high IQ? Is it your education? What is the authority? I actually spoke to a doctor on one occasion. He was patting me on the head. He said, you know, at one time in my life, I believed the things that you do. I took some courses in philosophy and my views broadened, he said. Okay? But 
here's the question. So who's the authority, doctor? Is it you? Is it your professor who taught you philosophy? Or is it philosophy itself, the discipline of it all? Who's the authority? Well, for the believer, the Bible is always the standard. That's our authority. The Word of God is Amos's plumb line by which everything is measured. So the apostle reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews here and the God-fearing Gentiles in Acts chapter 17. And so, let's take a moment and let's look at his argumentation. Proving all men to be liars universally. Who is he speaking with? He's speaking to the idolatrous Greeks who don't know the Word of God, who are not familiar with the Torah, who know nothing of the promises, uh, nor the, uh, the prophets, nor the law itself. He has been up, up, opened a position to speak to people on Mars Hill. The elitists of Athens. Now look at his beginning. It starts in verse 24. The God who made heaven and earth, the God who made heaven and earth, and in it and everything is the Lord of heaven and earth. Now, look what he just did. Look what he just did. See that word is in your translation? He has presupposed and he has declared his starting point. Why is it a starting point? Because there's nothing that precedes it. You run a race, you start at the blocks, you start at a line. Nothing preceded that line. This is where the Apostle Paul starts. He sets it forth. The Lord of heaven and earth is. I'm not going to define Him. I'm going to declare Him, he tells us. The living God, the maker of all things, heaven and earth. Second, verse 26, look at The God, this God that He is declaring is sovereign over the earth. He made the nations. He appointed the times that all men would live. The boundary lines of everyone. The times and places. Verse 29, he is not an image. James Warwick Montgomery said, well, the idol that he is referring to, the idol of the unknown God, is the common ground. No, that's not a common ground. The apostle diametrically opposes that idol. He used that idol as a reference point to get them to think. But the God he is declaring is not an idol. He's not represented by an idol. He's absolutely invisible. Diametrically opposed to any idols. He tells us, verse 29, not an image, silver and gold. Verse 30, look what he says. We're answerable to him. All men must repent, he says. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Verse 31, look what he says. He's coming to judge the world. And he has a proof. And you know what that proof is? That proof is that He resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. Now stop and think for a moment. He is not talking outside some synagogue. He is not in a synagogue. He is on Mars Hill. He's talking to an elitist audience in a different culture altogether who are not acquainted with the Scriptures. And what did He declare to them? The resurrection of the man Jesus. 
And they have no Bibles to look at. No. But he calls it a proof. It establishes his authority. And so, that's what he did. And that's what he declared. Now, there were three results from the apostle doing this. The first, these men that heard him, they called him a babbler. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Some said, we're going to hear more from you. We'll think about this and we'll listen some more. And then there's a third group. And the third group heard, they followed, and they believed. John chapter 10, verse 27. The Lord Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. What did the apostle just do? He stated his starting point. Then proposition, proposition, proposition. And what were those propositions? Authority, authority, authority. He didn't prove anything. He was taking the air out of the room by making these de declarations. And men listened. And the Word of God separated the men. Cut them. And so, it is not your smarts. You're not the authority. It's the Scriptures. My friends, when you get away from the Bible and step out and discuss the age of the earth, the depth of the universe, the logic or non-logic of something, you're stepping into utter darkness. But when you stay in the Word of God, that is the high road. That's the top of the mountain. You don't need to prove anything. It declares the truth. And here's what Paul tells us in the book of Romans. That as you declare that truth, there's a tiny, tiny microphone in the heart of every man. Calvin called it sensus datatus, the sense of God. And the Word of God goes forth, and the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews tells us that it cuts down deep between marrow and flesh and muscle. It goes into that man, and that man, and man says, these things are true. And so what does he do? The unbeliever. He suppresses that truth. And he goes on his way. Man may, r remains in a fog and he says, well, I, I need to think about this. I'll come back. But then some believe because they heard that voice. And that's Paul, and that's how he reasoned with them. You and I reason with people that way, and people will be exposed. Don't get off the path. Stay in the Scriptures. Now, here's this exemplary prayer, verses 7 through 9. The only prayer in the book of Proverbs. Pray this way and you'll pray with great wisdom. The first feature as we look at it is his boldness. Verse 7, I ask, do not withhold. Verse 8, keep far from me. Do not give me. Provide, he says. The second observation is its specificity. Look, two things. He's asking God to work precisely without any equivocation whatsoever. Now, if you hang around Believer's Chapel long enough, you will hear a familiar name. It is the name George Mueller. He happens to be one of my heroes. I've read all of the biographies 
in English print on the life of George Mueller. People that don't like Mueller or disagree with Mueller have things like this. Well, that may be for Mueller, but it's not for everyone else. They really don't understand the story. So I'm going to give it to you, compressed for a moment. Mueller was a pastor in Bristol, England. He had a large congregation, but he noticed over time people would not meet. They would not assemble themselves with one another. And so he would go visit these people in their homes. And they would say the same thing. He heard it over and over. Mr. Mueller, I work six days a week. Mr. Mueller, I work seven days a week. Mr. Mueller, I'm working all the time. I have no time to go to church. I have no time to listen to the Word of God or prayer. He said, and that's when God put it in my mind. I wasn't thinking about orphans or building orphans' homes. I was thinking about a demonstration to people. And here's the proposition of his demonstration. That God can do more for you than you could ever think you could do for yourself. So for you grinders out there, listen to Mueller. Here's what he did. To demonstrate it, Psalm 68, 5, I'm a father to the fatherless. Okay, enough said. I'm going to take God at His word. And I'm going to demonstrate to people that by His power alone, and not men's, God will do a mighty work more than men could ever conceive for themselves. And so, how did He start? He began to pray, prayed specifically. God put forth a demonstration using the orphans that run all over Bristol, England. And guess what happened? A penniless seamstress. Think about that. She had very little money, meager life. She got an inheritance and she said, Mr. Mueller, God has prompted me to give you this money. I don't know what for. No one knew what was in Mueller's heart. But God has prompted me to give this to you. She set it on the table in front of him. He said, no. You need this money for the rest of your life. Remember, he said that. He held the money for three days. He prayed earnestly that she would come and take it back. But God had other designs. You know, I heard Dan preach 25, 30 years ago. And he used the illustration of Luther's silver cup. Luther had a silver cup. And Luther was known as a very gregarious and generous man to people always. And he gave away this silver cup to a friend. And Dan's point was that Mrs. Luther, Katie, wasn't very happy with him about it. She was angry. He gave away the silver cup. But Dan's point is, believe me, she's not missing that cup now, standing in heaven. Well, believe me, this penniless seamstress, she missed nothing. She was the ground floor to a worldwide work. And who would God choose to do that with? A billionaire? A tech billionaire? Owns airlines? Owns half of Wall Street? No. He takes the weakest thing to make one of the greatest things. Think about your life. Think about what God can do with and through you. And so, so Mueller said, I'm going to demonstrate to people everywhere that God can and will do more 
for you than you can do for yourself. And that's why he would tell no one of the needs of the orphan's home. And he went out, took that, that seamstress money, he bought property, he started building. And guess what happened then? Gifts came. What are you building, Mr. Mueller? Building an orphan's home. Okay. What else? That's it. That's, that's it. End of story. And gifts came in. Mueller said from all over the world. He kept meticulous records. Roger Steer's book, Delighted in God, the story of George Mueller. He has all of these pages and journals of the exact amounts that came in. This and that and this and where they came from. He didn't know half the people. Did God test him? Oh, yes, he tested him. Did he test the orphans in the home? Oh, yes, he tested them. Did they lack? Never. Did God prove to be the father to the fatherless? Absolutely. Now, my friends, you want a wise prayer? Here's the wise prayer. He says two things, very specific. And he prays for a reason. We'll see that in just a moment. Mueller said, God does not operate in the realm of the human possible. Think about it. Not the realm of the human possible. Oh, you must understand. I'm really smart. You must understand. I've got two or three degrees. Oh, you must understand. I'm always good at this. I'm always good at that. Mueller says, that's not this prayer of faith. That's not the life. God does not operate in the realm of the possible. God receives no glory in the realm of the possible. He gains His glory by what He and He alone does. Not because of men and not because of men's plans. Look, in these two things, Agur is praying and he is praying logically. Verse 9, Otherwise, see the logic, lest, so that, he's expressing a logical conclusion. And finally, the end. Don't miss the end because it explains everything about the prayer and why prayer needs to be answered. He says that God would be dishonored, profaned where God would not be glorified. You want a prayer that is expressed straight to heaven? Pray that God would be glorified in any and everything. Our Lord Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Our light is to shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. It's all about Him. It's all about His glory. Never ours. And that is the beeline to heaven. The chief end of man, the Westminster Catechism, is to glorify God. Now, let's get into the prayer. Verse 3. The prayer of wisdom. Verse 7. He said, I ask, now, let's stop right there. Who's asking? Who's asking? Is it the qualified man? Is it the strong man? No, it's the weak man. It's the man who has nothing. It's the penniless seamstress that was the first gift to the orphan's home in Bristol, England. It's the weak. That's who's asking. He is the weak man 
of verse 1, line 3, who says he will prevail, he will break through, he will overcome, he will conquer. George Mueller's impossibility. That's, what is, that's who is asking. God's power begins where man's strength ends. And so, how does Agur progress? How does he prevail? He has listened to wisdom. He has absorbed it. He has memorized it. It is God's Word, and now He is going to apply it by prayer. Verse 7, praying. Praying and praying specifically. James 4, 2. You have not because you ask not. Notice the imperative. I ask of you, do not withhold from me earnestly, passionately, intensely. Charles Bridges in his commentary on Proverbs says he prays like the dying sinner. I love that. Before I die. So here's the way I've tried to incorporate that prayer in my own life. I say, Lord, here is my request and do it. Do it now. Do it today. Do it this hour. Do it this minute. Because I may die and not see the answer. And I want to see the answer because I want you to be glorified in it. That's how this prayer changed me. Before I die. Pray that way. You pray with wisdom. Pray with a recognition of pending death. Do it now. Show us your arm this minute. Cecil John Rhodes was the great British scholar, multi-millionaire of a bygone day. They named the Rhodes Scholarship after him. Cecil John Rhodes. He accomplished much, worldly much, in this life. And then the end came. And men recorded his words because he was a brilliant man and had great insight into doing many, many things. So they recorded his words. He was about to die. Here's one of them. So much to do. So little time to do it. So much to do. So little time to do it. Now, I put that quote up on the left side of the page, and right next to it, I put the quote, I put the quote of Jim Elliott, who was speared in the river trying to reach the Alka Indians. And here's what Jim Elliott said. He said, live your life in such a way that all you have to do is die. Cecil John Rhodes, a man of much accomplishment. Listen to the frustration. He had that big brain. He could see all these things to be done and he's not going to get his hands on them. And here's a man who's in his 20s out there in the jungle trying to reach people for Jesus Christ. And he says, Live your life in such a way that all you have to do is die. There's no frustration there. That's peace. And you know how you build that peace? By walking in wisdom one day at a time. Stacking your days. Stacking them up like you stack dishes. The NFL... They, they talk about stacking their practice days. When you have a great day of practice, stack another one on top of it. And another and another. Live your life that way. And you're killed. The disease comes. Lightning strikes you. All you have to do is die. No frustration. And Cecil John Rhodes spins off to a Christless eternity. What is wisdom teaching us? To live a full life. To live a fulfilled life. A life of accomplishment. A life of purpose. 
And in all those things, they can be done by prayer. Not you doing, God doing. So ask. Verse 8, a deceitful lie keep far from me. If your translation reads, remove from me, keep far from me is the better translation. Because this is the exact construction. Now when I say the exact construction, here's what I mean. That the word order is exactly the same and the vocabulary is the same. So it's like these two sentences pair up line for line, word for word. And here it is. Proverbs 4.24, rid, put away, crooked and deceitful talk. And here it is. Perverse speech, keep far away from me. Now, if you think about it, there's a big difference between remove from me and keep away from me. Remove from me indicates a change within himself. Now, let me clarify. That is New Testament sanctification. That's called progressive sanctification. That you are actually being conformed into the image of Christ. That's New Testament doctrine. And that's New Testament truth. My point simply is that that's not what's being taught here. This is another idea. And so we're going to separate. Keep far away from me. It's more of the idea of providential removal from hindrances. The deceitful lie or liar. The deceit, the hurt or the harm that one delivers to another. The hidden agendas, the manipulation of people, the falsity that they give to you believing one thing, but in fact, you get something else. So I understand keep far away from me like the petition in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, and lead us not into temptation. Now here it is, but deliver us from evil. Providential evils that could be in our path. David, Psalm 36 do not let the foot of the proud come against me, or the hand of the wicked drive me away. It's the same idea. They're parallel. So that liars, deceitful people would by providence be kept clear from the lives of the wise. He goes on, do not give me. What's he asking for here? Middle class status. Not affluence, but not poverty. Now this is where we have to think. We have to really contemplate this prayer. Uh, the man who put me in business in 1985 was not a Christian. But he was a very wise man in a lot of ways. He had a great moral attitude when it came to business. And I, I had no idea at the time when he gave me the money to start the company that he was worth a vast fortune. That the amount of money he gave me was like a speck on his bank records. But I didn't know that. Why didn't I know that? Because his attitude was humility and kindness and humble. This is an attitude that we need to adapt for wisdom, whether you have money or you don't have money. I always admired that about this man. So here, wisdom requests to not have economic extremes. Here they are, poverty or riches. Poverty is first in order, literally means destitute. How can you serve others if you're always in need yourself? Always in need. I always am behind. Well, then ask of God who gives liberally. Ask Him and be specific about it. Don't you have a desire to do that? That you could foster more things from yourself for the kingdom? Here's a second item. 
riches. Now, in a capitalistic society, that's the goal, right? But in wisdom literature, we have to think our way through carefully because riches are associated with evil in wisdom literature. For example, Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor. That word rule is the idea of oppression. During the times of Elijah, the man of God, a widow came to him in appeal that her husband, who is deceased, was one of the sons of the prophets. And he owed a man, and that man for payment was coming for her two children. She appealed to him on that basis. So this word riches in wisdom literature has the idea of oppression. But there's two sides to every coin. In wisdom literature, to have money is to be wise. It's associated with wisdom. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. She has an abundance. This, the ant has saved up a big portion of abundance for the future. So, with those two things true and congruent, we have a tension. How do we resolve the tension? By asking, what is this man, Agur, praying for? What is he praying about? Here's his prayer alluding to. I think it's a recognition of what he already told us in verse 1, line 3. He's a weak man. He's a depraved man. With wealth, men can do crazy things. Forget who they are. Forget where they came from. Think they're better. Treat people differently. I'm unique. I'm special. And that attitude is ugly. It's offensive. And in the Proverbs, it's an abomination to God. The God who has given you everything. What He alone has put at your disposal, in your possession, you are to use it for Him. And that's not just money. That's time, energy, talent. It is your skill. Put it to work and serve Him in all kinds of ways. Now, look at this last line, provide. Your translation may read, give, feed. It's an interesting word. It's used of wild beasts tearing the flesh. Eating up, consuming another animal. This verb tones it down here. So we translate it to cause or to receive or just to provide. Provide my portion, my quota of food. Now that word quota is interesting as well. It occurs in an interesting place in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 22. They're in the midst of the famine and Joseph is rationing out the food and the people run out of money. And there's still more famine. You got more famine, no money. So he buys the land from the people and deeds it to Pharaoh. But Genesis chapter 47, verse 22, something interesting. The Pharaoh himself had a carve out. He had a separate portion. That's your word. That's the idea for the priests of the Pharaoh. He had a separate arrangement with and for them so that they could be fed. So here's the conclusion. Verse 9, lest otherwise so that it's a logical explanation of his petitions so that I would not disavow, deny, become a scoffer, a blasphemer. In other words, that the glory of God and His honor would be tarnished before men. You know what he's praying? He is praying that God's will in His glory be accomplished over His own personal wishes and desires for himself. 
You know why that's important? Because that's exactly what our Lord Jesus prayed in Luke chapter 22, 42, when He said, Not my will, but yours alone be done. So, what's He talking about? If He were to forget the Lord, not bring Him glory, He would be stealing, do violence. And to do violence to whom? To God, to besmirch, to befame. And that might convince others to do the same thing. Then His light would not be shining before others. And men would not be praising God for His good works. So what is the action of a fool? The fool in the universe that is created by wisdom, by the providence of God, he's on borrowed time, my friends. He's on borrowed time. He takes a clock and he stops the hands and he tries to bend them back. What do you do when you do that to a clock? You break it on the inside. That's what the fool does. He doesn't go along with the way the universe has been built in wisdom and the way it flows. No, he's a fool. He's going to go contrary to it. And he breaks, not the clock. He breaks. God breaks the fool. God shows men to be liars. God is to be honored above all things. And when you do that, and you pray like that, then you have the spirit of George Mueller who demonstrated to all of us the power of God in prayer for His glory's sake and not man's. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study today. Thank You for these people that come to hear the Scriptures, the Word of God, the authority of Your Word. May this word, good Word rattle within their souls that they would live lives that are not only transparent, but transformative to the glory of God, that their prayers would be powerful and bold and specific as a demonstration that you have a plan and purpose and you choose to use us to do it. And it is to that end that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.